When court resumes on Monday, the defense will cross-examine the final prosecution witness. Then the prosecution is expected to formally rest its case. My co-counsel, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson, is back with me to talk about week five of this trial. Paul, jurors spent most of the day hearing from a woman named Cheryl. Uh, she's a former talent manager who later became Kelly's assistant. She got emotional talking about a 17-year-old girl she introduced to Kelly in an effort to help her um, singing career. Now, keep in mind, this is the same witness who was too emotional to testify on Wednesday. Um, what parts of her testimony do you believe did the most damage to the defense? Well, I think a, a number of things. One is the foundation that she laid of her relationship with R. Kelly over a decade dealing with him in and out in different roles and in different capacities under his direction and control, talking about what happened to employees when you work for R. Kelly. I think the narrative that she talked about that both highlighted and typified what happened when you work for R. Kelly was really resonating with a jury like this, especially in the context of the narrative she told about the sexual harassment lawsuit that R. Kelly thought he might find against him. Because the things that she talked about in an emotional way that I think will resonate are three things. One, that R. Kelly was very clear about how she as an employee had to pick a side. And then two, when he had her write a letter as part of just the employment about dictating to defend himself against things that weren't true that he narrated to her and forced her to write to defend or obscure the truth about what was going on about illegal or inappropriate behavior. And now let's keep in mind that writing that letter is consistent with a lot of the other testimony that we've heard, not just from employees, but from the alleged victims in this case. And so that rings true as well. And then the third thing that really stood out to me was the fact that she articulated very clearly about how she felt threatened by his communications and his conversations with R. Kelly. And all of that matters is because now I feel like the prosecution case is really trying to wrap up and focus on the elements that they're going to have to argue for the racketeering charges specifically. And I think that's what's gonna make a difference. And presumably towards the end and in closing, they're going to make a point to clarify for the jury why that specific testimony towards the end of the trial is absolutely relevant because it speaks to the elements that they are going to have to prove in this trial. Uh, Paul, Cheryl um, said that Kelly told her she had to pick a side after that young woman filed a sexual harassment suit. Um, she also said that Kelly told her that, quote, people come up missing in these situations. How significant is that testimony? Absolutely. One, it shows that he is directing and controlling the things that she was asked to do that may have supported illegal outcomes. And two, it shows the very specific language that he was using to validate whether or not that threat was real. And so it wasn't just a passing comment that all of these people around him were performing in the way that they did to groom, assist, validate, and encourage women, groupies, fans, boys, young children, whatever, to act inappropriately with R. Kelly. These were things that were that he was directing. And again, all of this goes to the elements that the prosecution has to prove for racketeering, that R. Kelly was using his business enterprise to commit illegal acts, and that these were ongoing elements, ongoing events that had happened more than once. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that the outcome of this was that either he committed illegal acts or attempted to commit illegal acts. So even if you can't confirm that he absolutely did have sex with an underage minor, the fact that he was attempting to is enough to find him guilty. And that's why the language like this and the testimony from today is so important. And again, this is the testimony that is corroborated with half a dozen other employees that testified to similar uh, incidents. And more importantly, it underscores the over a dozen alleged victims of men and women that we're talking about the actual illegal behavior from statutory rape, but actually it wasn't a dozen of them, but a number of them talked about having sexual relations with R. Kelly while they were underage. All of these are the illegal acts, but it's important that we understand the box of racketeering, the, the elements that the prosecution has to prove. And, and that's why the testimony like this is so damning 
and it's so important and and why the prosecution is closing with it. Paul, Cheryl admitted that she wrote and signed a letter of apology, similar to what the other witnesses um, described. In her case, though, she says Kelly made her apologize for taking money from a booking agent. Um, she testified the letter was 1,000 percent scripted by Kelly. Uh, but the defense honed in on that and tried to shame her, saying that a woman her age, uh, which was late 40s, should have known better. How do you think that'll play with the jury, especially women her age that are sitting on that jury? I think badly, and were that my case, I would have rehabilitated her and used that exact language to make sure that it was highlighted with the jury to hear how inappropriate it was. But here's why that matters. That same letter, which I presume defense will use these letters later on, but we'll get back to that in a second. What I think stands out is that these letters were being being used regularly, not just with the employees, not just with the security guards, not just with his assistants, but with many of the victims and witnesses as well, all, uh, all talked about these letters that they had to write. And it could not be more clear with all of the corroborative evidence that went in, which is the testimony, that these letters were coerced, that these letters were dictated by R. Kelly, and that these letters were false. And the reason that people had to write these letters and draft these letters was to obscure, defend, or prevent R. Kelly from being accountable for bad behavior. That's the key. And I think people are gonna listen to these narratives before defense even gets to take the stand and try and introduce all of these letters from everyone. And the jury's gonna have to wonder like, huh, how interesting is it that every single person around R. Kelly has these letters that they had to write or that were written where they in, they talked about themselves negatively or they condemned themselves for bad behavior or they swore that they were going to lie or try and condemn R. Kelly in the future. I, I think it takes away part of the defense's argument and that's why prosecution is focused on it and getting these witnesses that they're putting on the stand to articulate and talk about the letter because all of them that wrote letters are talking about it, and I think that's intentional by prosecution. You don't have people up there on accident to present evidence like that. Well, the prosecution called its final witness today a clinical and forensic psychologist. She talked about uh, the kind of trauma some of Kelly's accusers may have suffered, talked about the um, strategy behind, um, we'll talk about the strategy behind having her be the last voice that the jury will hear from the prosecution. Well, it does two things. One, it leaves the case with a bow of an expert that they can rely on, independent of the witnesses that they have been put on the stand. And then two, it answers a lot of questions for the jury that may be distracted by the behavior of a lot of these witnesses, meaning the fans, that could be distracted and even judgmental about, why did you sleep with them? Why didn't you tell other people if this was inappropriate? Why didn't you do anything? Why would you take a gift? So to talk about that psychology, and this is a very similar thing, as you know, with cases like this, especially when you're talking about domestic violence cases or abuse cases, it really is helpful for a jury to understand why would someone do that? Because then they can believe why someone did that if they understand the psychology behind it. I've been saying, and we've been talking about it from the beginning of this case, I've been waiting to hear from a psychologist to come on and explain some of this behavior to a jury. And from my perspective, I think one, it answers the questions for the jury about why people did what they did. And then two, it presents an element of professionalism from a professional witness onto, presented to this jury that allows them to follow the path of the arguments that prosecution is going to present to this audience to explain why they believe, based on the evidence that's been presented, that R. Kelly is guilty. All right, veteran prosecutor and legal contributor Paul Henderson, thank you so much for joining me on this Friday night. Gang member turned speaker and activist. Coming up, we'll hear the inspirational story of Arthur Silky Slim Reed and how he's using his past experiences to make a difference. 